Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Uh, I'm really pleased to have uh, Acting Deputy Administrator John Barsa to make some opening remarks, and then we're going to have a panel discussion with many of the, the folks. We've got a really interesting panel to have a conversation about this. So I'm going to turn the floor over to John. John, thanks for being here. Dan, really, uh, thank you. And really, um, uh, your, your comments are just like spot on. Good governance, private sector, um, really. Um, so thank you for setting the stage because you, you've nailed it. You, you've, you've laid the challenges before. So it really is a pleasure. And trade is a driver of mutual prosperity. Economic growth bolsters stability and it mitigates many of the conditions that contribute to violent extremism. We recognize that an emphasis on human rights, individual liberty, and democratic accountability is a core foundation for economic growth and development. Economic growth is critical for countries to lead their own development where they plan, finance, and implement solutions to their own challenges with long-term sustainability. Uh, that's why today I'm proud to launch USAID's new economic growth policy, which lays out our development model and advocates for an enterprise-driven approach. Our model is more effective at helping partner countries drive their own development in comparison to models that are state-led, less inclusive, and less transparent. Building on our economic growth strategy from 2008, the policy emphasizes that economic growth through greater pro productivity at the enterprise level is the most effective way to foster self-reliance and end the need for foreign assistance. The new policy complements our private sector engagement policy and it focuses on our, our assistance to pursue market-based solutions and investments with the private sector. USAID's private sector partnerships leverage both financial resources and technical expertise. And other US government partners, including the US International Development Finance Corporation will be critical to this policy success. USAID has proven that we can support the reforms that make even more private investment possible. For example, between 2010 and 2018, our trade and investment hubs created more than $600 million in investment opportunities for the private sector in Africa. For every dollar spent on trade programs, the hubs leverage $9 in private investment. This trade and investment grows the U.S. economy by generating new markets for American goods and services. In fact, American-led companies exported nearly $27 billion in goods to Africa in 2019. A key principle of the new policy is to equip our partner countries to self-finance their development activities. Throughout history, we've seen countries that once received foreign assistance ultimately develop the resources and commitments to finance and address their own challenges. This sustained economic growth will depend on systemic change. With the new policy, USAID will focus on reforms that increase revenue generation, cut waste, and reduce any burdens for the private sector to thrive. Dan nailed it on the front end. Strengthening market systems, improving policies and governance, and creating opportunities for low-income communities can improve the lives of everyone rather than only benefiting a few. Broad-based private sector-led growth directly increases revenues for the public sector to invest in social and infrastructure projects, which are essential for further prosperity. Our partner countries cannot be self-reliant when large segments of the population are shut out of the economy. The new policy pledges that USAID programs will ensure that there are economic opportunities for groups who are marginalized with a strong focus on women. In the past few years, the White House led Women's Global Development and Prosperity Initiative, Initiative, WGDP, has been the first whole of government approach to advance the economic empowerment of women globally. USAID advances WGDP's goals by addressing the barriers that women face to ensure that they have the same market opportunities as men. This work often involves changing outdated laws, enforcing existing rights, upgrading employer practices, and engaging both men and women to rethink restrictive social norms. Our new economic growth policy further supports WGDP by promoting best practices to integrate women into the formal workforce, making it easier to successfully launch and grow a business, 
as well as increasing women's access to and control over financial assets. Over the past year, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed how much the world depends on individual countries for a wide range of products and technologies. As international businesses diversify their sourcing in response, this moment is a unique opportunity for the countries where we work. In addition, rapidly growing debt is becoming unsustainable in many of these countries. USAID must support our partner countries to more effectively manage debt and public finances with transparency, especially since effective fiscal responses to the pandemic are critical to avoid the worst economic impacts. A fundamental priority for USAID has been to demonstrate the value of our programs to American taxpayers. In recent years, a majority of the growth in US exports has been to countries where USAID works. Our investments in facilitating, facilitating trade have been mutually beneficial, supporting jobs here in the US as well as abroad. Ultimately, we all benefit when USAID invests in trade and investment opportunities for shared prosperity. Growing economies with more prosperous citizens increases demand for US goods and services and a level playing field offers new opportunities for US companies abroad. While the journey to self-reliance will look different in the countries where we work, a common thread is the spirit of everyone everywhere to be self-reliant. We invite our partners and other donors to join us in promoting economic growth as an indispensable, indispensable step along the way. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, CSIS, for this opportunity. Thanks, John. Thanks a lot. We've got a really great panel. Uh, I want to uh, recognize Michelle Beckring, who has been really helpful in getting this policy through. So, Michelle, let me start with you. So, one principle of the policy is that economic growth must be inclusive. Why is the policy elevating the importance of inclusive growth? I over to you, Michelle. Great, Dan, thank you. And thank you so much for uh, hosting today's conversation and, and your support uh, along with so many of the external community who have joined us today. We're, we're delighted by the turnout. And um, as you mentioned as a quick preamble, uh, this is something that's been almost two years in the making and it was extremely participatory. And I am just, I'm proud uh, that along with the uh, Acting Administrator, I'm able to come and present the great work of our team. So Dan, you mentioned inclusive growth, and this is something um, that's not only really personal to me, it's really so much of a foundation of what uh, this new policy shows, right? So if you think about what the mission of USAID is, right? Lifting lives, building communities, um, establishing self-sufficiency. If we're going to meet those goals, we have to include every member of society, right? We know this uh, across the world, when you have economic uh, gains that are concentrated at a certain you know, top social strata, um, it's eroding social uh, cohesion, it's limiting competition in the market. And one of the things we've seen over the last couple of years is that a lot of the economic growth we saw in the developing world, it generally was not accompanied by increased income equality. Um, and we have specifically seen this when it comes to marginalized populations. And the one we talk about uh, most prominently is women, right? It's 50% of the world, it should be 50% of the workforce. But we don't see those numbers. We see huge uh, income equality. We of course see formal labor participation um, variances. And of course, um, the statistic we talk about a lot and we do because it's so important is that if women participated in equal rates as men in the um, economy, global GDP would rise by $12 trillion by 2025. Frankly, as a development agency, you can't ignore those numbers. Um, and so what we did with the economic growth policy is we kind of stood back and said, what are we already doing when it comes to uh, women's economic empowerment, when it comes to inclusive growth? Are our programs traditionally, you know, are they really looking at, you know, targeted segments of the population where maybe there are increased barriers and gaps? Do we need to have more targeted specific interventions for those groups to make sure as a whole we're meeting our goals? Um, you mentioned and the um, administrator mentioned earlier the Women's Global Development Prosperity Initiative. That's something I've been really proud to uh, support along with Ms. Trump and the White House. You know, 
it's not that, you know, USAID had never focused on women's economic empowerment. One of the things you see through the policy and was really a lesson learned from WGDP, we really have started to have a laser-like focus. Okay, we want to invest in women. We want to see them economically empowered. How do we do that, right? And so what you see is we're really focusing now on three areas of our work. We're looking at how do we bring women into the economy in the first place? How do we focus specifically on women as entrepreneurs, recognizing the role entrepreneurs, of course, play in creating jobs? And third, and something um, that's important to myself and others in the agency with a DRG background is legal reform. What is the enabling environment? And so we look at all of that in the new policy. We recognize if we don't have the enabling environment, the regulatory frameworks we need, we're not going to have sustainable, uh, it, it, frankly, um, there won't be sustainable effects of our goals. Um, so the policy emphasizes that and, and we're proud. It builds on the strong work we've already done, but I think it takes it in new directions. Great, great. Okay, Bill, you were the point person on this uh, policy, and uh, but I think it was the work of many, many people. Robin Broughton, there was a whole economic growth team. You went out to all the different regional uh, bureaus. You went out to the field. You got lots and lots of internal. There must have been several dozen consultations. I saw it in the in the policy. Then you went out to uh, at least two dozen external voices. So. So yes, you were the point person, but this was sort of the work of many. So, so Bill, tell us about, so you're at the economic growth team at, at USAID. So what's changed, Bill, since 13 years ago? Why did you need to update this policy? I told you why I think you needed to update this policy. And I think Michelle did a great job of, of, of underlining the fact that, you know, we've got some, you know, capitalism is great and private enterprise is great, but sometimes there's some things that, you know, you know, it's not perfect and there's some things we, we could do better. So, so Bill, why did you all update this policy? Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, as, as you said, uh, when you opened uh, in your opening remarks, I mean, we, so much has changed in the last, you know, 13, 14 years since the last iteration of this policy uh, was released. And we, you know, we can't keep doing the same things that we were doing. Uh, 13, 14 years ago. <laughs> we can't even keep doing the same things that we're doing one year ago, <laughs> right? Uh, as we've learned, because development has just changed so fast. And so uh, this policy is by and for uh, our field, uh, our, our, our staff in the field, uh, particularly in the field. And uh, speaking from, you know, having served pretty much all last decade, uh, in the field, uh, I know that our staff need this sort of shared approach. We, we need a shared approach to thinking about development and to approaching development problems. Uh, I, I noticed that that was missing. So that is the main purpose of this policy. It's, it's, it's for our staff, it's for our technical staff. I mean, just for example, um, we talked about resilience. Uh, the policy includes best practices uh, on increasing resilience to economic shocks. Uh, uh, it talks about working in fragile states because that's a lot of what we're doing uh, these days. The, the previous policy didn't mention uh, those two topics. They didn't really come up because they weren't uh, a, a major issue uh, at that point in time. So that's just one example. Another example, of course, the, uh, the changing nature of global trade, global value chains uh, just exploding onto the scene. Uh, during this, Sorry, can I interrupt you, Bill? Sure. I'm, my hope is we're going to get a partial economic divorce from China. I've had it this whole sitting in my basement thing, and I blame them partially. So one of my great hopes is that we get a partial economic divorce from them. So I'm hoping for big tectonic shifts in global supply chains. I hope they come to Mexico, Central America. I hope they go to Southeast Asia. I hope they go to Africa. I hope they go to Central and Eastern Europe. I'm done. I'm done. It's and so huge. basically, in my mind, we're going to see ODA, if I'm a betting person, as a lubricant uh, for this kind of stuff that you're talking about. Like, I think you're going to see a lot of shifts in global supply chains. Like, I've had done 500 Zoom calls, Bill, in the last, since March 15th, and I've got like three or four deep thoughts after 500 Zoom calls. And one of them is this, that we're going to get some kind of partial economic divorce from China. And what we're going to see is large tectonic shifts in supply chain. So this policy 
is and the guidance in this policy is going to help the field of aid missions in non-China, Asia, or Latin America or Africa kind of get, you know, that that's something that's going that is a really big change that's coming now and over the next 10 years. Okay, uh, keep going. I, I absolutely agree. I think it's a huge opportunity. I think this creates a huge opportunity. Uh, again, like you said, to diversify supply chains, I think it's going to create lots of opportunities uh, for developing countries to shift. Uh, you know, but in, in order to do that, in order to help facilitate that process, uh, you know, our staff needs to understand these trends, right? We need a central document to help our staff understand these trends and apply uh, these these trends to our work, right? And that's, you know, I'm in the reports business. Who do you want to read this? Who on the staff? Do you want FSNs reading this? Do you want program officers reading this? Is this economic growth cool. officers? Who should be reading this document if you're in the in the in the development community? It really is, uh, you know, like I said, this is a document that's by and for uh, USAID staff. Uh, and, you know, while this is a, a document that's only, uh, only supposed to cover the economic growth technical backstop and the economic growth programming, which is just one out of many different sectors in which USAID works, as you know, I think that the lessons that it provides and, and the approaches and the best practices that it offers uh, have widespread applicability. Uh, hopefully, you know, across USAID and even more so uh, to the larger development community. I, I really hope that uh, the larger development community reads this and starts discussing. Okay, so don't make this a Netflix night development community. Like if you're at DAI, you're at Plan USA, if you're at Cadasta, you're at uh, Catholic Relief Services, like you should be clearing your calendar and actually this is, so if you're in the implementer community, you should also be reading that reading this. Is that right, Bill? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, That's the right answer, it, yes. It, 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 yes. Especially if you answer. want to continue doing business with USAID. I hope there's a lot of implementing partners on but that. But don't you want global health folks reading this? Don't you want democracy rights and governance people reading this? Don't you want education people reading this, right? Absolutely. Well, like I said, it, it's, it's, it's only intended to cover the principles cover the economic growth technical backstop, but its principles I think can be applied across development. Well, I want you to know, I passed up a couple of episodes of The Crown to catch up on my on your, your new policy. It was great. And I encourage everybody to pass a couple episodes of The Crown to read the new policy. But it's really important because what this matters because when there's gonna be some program design or policy dialogue with governments or engagement with other donors, this is gonna be the this is going to there are folks who may not think about economic growth or private enterprise for a living. They're going to consult this five years from now. Isn't that right, Bill? Isn't this that's why it's important? It's not important for today, but for five or ten years from now, as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, we hope this has a long shelf life. Yeah. You know, one of the things that hasn't changed well, as a betting change. person, this is probably going to be here for at least ten years, Bill. And maybe right. longer, this is given the track record. I mean, we've talked about the things that have changed, but what hasn't changed? Uh, from the previous document, again, is the focus on enterprise level productivity. Uh, that continues to be our main thrust to uh, economic growth program. So let me just leave this audience with something else. Nine out of 10 jobs in the developing world, this is World Bank statistics, are in the private sector. Some informal, but informal, but nine out of 10 jobs. It could be smallholder farmers, the kind of folks that Amy works with. It could be shoe shine folks. It could be folks at a factory, but nine out of 10, it's not NGOs. It's not the faith community. Those are important institutions. I'm all for it or government. Nine out of 10 is in the private sector. I want them to be in the formal private sector. Okay, Tessie, you're not necessarily in the private enterprise business, but though Plan USA does a variety of different things. You're also a senior states person in the global development community. You're one of the leads of the MFAN network. You're a friend and colleague of mine. So I wanted, I was so pleased you agreed to do this because I didn't want straight up private enterprise people per se to talk about this because I want folks who don't do that for a living to hear from someone like you as to why this is important. And that's the same why I wanted Amy Kokenauer Betancourt to, to speak as well. So what's your reaction to this and why is this important, Tessie, from where you sit? Um, yeah, well, thanks, Dan, and good morning to everyone. Um, well, and, and by the way, thank you for the opportunity, as I think, um, you know, uh, Bill and others know, 
Yeah, I've been involved in the um, economic growth in the development of that first document 2000 and 2007. So for 13 years, I have been involved on and off in this area. Um, so it is good to to see this. Now, allow me sort of four quick comments in terms of um, my uh, my reaction. You know, I, I have to sort of as a preface to all of it, you know, I've heard, um, you know, people say, well, OK, but why are we launching this now? You know, what it, you know, is, is this, you know, what is it with the timing is the end of, you know, the administration is, this, you know, and, and so I want to put that particular elephant in the room. But um, from my perspective, the timing is, 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 is okay, it's fine. And why is that? Well, because as it's been mentioned here, you know, for the first time in, you know, over 20 years, we're seeing a huge increase, right, in the number of people living in extreme poverty. Um, and by this year, we're expecting 150 million people more to be falling under that $1.90 a day threshold. Um, and, uh, and the other aspect of it is not just the number of people that are falling into extreme poverty. And by the way, you know, women and girls hugely affected by that dynamic, uh, but we're seeing, you know, rising inequality, which is honestly the problem, the problem of our time. Uh, so it's not just the number of people in extreme poverty, but a growing inequality, which is creating a break on economic growth, right? It is slowing it down. We all know that. So I would say that, you know, let's put politics aside, you know, in terms of the timing. Um, and I'm directing it at people that have asked me that question. If, we, if one can put politics aside in this town, um, the, the fact of the matter is, now is the time to be thinking about economic growth, not just as a sidebar to what we do in global health and, and around the pandemic response, but as an essential element of development assistance and what, the, and, and what USAID and the US government is going to do. Um, economic growth principles, as has been mentioned here, and as is talked about in the policy, are, are um, essential to be thinking about everything from how perhaps you know, we do vaccinations uh, to how um, we design obviously economic relief and then long-term economic development programming. So, so that's essential. Now, now uh, allow me sort of three kvetches if I, if, I, if I would, things that I would have wanted to see uh, perhaps treated slight, uh, a bit different. Um, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, Michelle's, uh, you know, uh, very eloquent words around uh, inclusive growth and the importance of inclusive growth. Um, it, it really is not just about growth, but about the distribution of the income gains that come as a result of the growth, right? Um, and so that, with, with that, and maybe this is a, a subtlety, but I would like to have seen the policy move beyond just being inclusive um, to being really pro poor um, and really be about you know uh, poverty uh, reduction and and inequality and ad you know addressing inequality and we know that you know principles and how one applies them to how programs are designed and implemented have a big uh, you know had, can have a big influence in terms of the distribution uh, of those gains because look inclusive inclusion at the end of the day is about like making sure that people come to the party uh, or no, it's actually it's inclusion you could say is about making sure that people have an invitation to the party, but we want them to actually come to the party, right? And we want them to benefit from what we're offering at the party. And so we, we do need to think more, uh, more deeply about that in a world of rising inequality and the economic devastation and disruption that we're seeing right now, I think we can expect no less. Two other quick comments, um, you know, and you mentioned it, uh, 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 Dan, uh, fragile settings. Fragile settings is where USA does its work um, and, uh, and, and increasingly so, and, and actually the pandemic hasn't helped. And yes, at some point we'll get through it, but it won't be for years and, and fragile, um, you know, and we've learned a lot, I guess, in my opinion, about applying economic growth principles uh, and things around, you know, trade-offs, incentives, 
you know, the trade-off, for example, between equity and efficiency in the context of, you know, fragile settings is very different. So um, while the document, while the policy talks about that, I have to say a lot of what then the policy spends its time on sounds to me, and I, it may be unfair uh, to Bill and others, like, like, you know, more business as usual, your garden variety, enterprise driven growth in your average poor country, but we're not dealing with average, you know, poor countries uh, anymore. And we've learned a lot about economic recovery uh, efforts uh, in, in, uh, in a variety of fragile environments. And so making sure that we bring the richness of what we've learned, I think is absolutely essential. And then the last point is the, the which you also mentioned, and it, it, it struck me as the digital divide um, and attention to digital solutions. Um, yeah, we've all been living on our basement, but it's not just us, right? I mean, the world has um, to a great extent uh, become much more virtual and digitized. And yes, uh, value chains have become global. And as a result of all of these disruptions, they've also been hugely uh, uh, devastated in some cases, entire sectors. And so what does, uh, you know, how do we address that digital divide? Because uh, Dan, you just mentioned, it's true. There's some potentially enormous opportunities here for countries in Africa and elsewhere to really benefit, right, from these disruptions. But they're not going to benefit from the disruption if we are not addressing intentionally the digital divide. And then the question becomes, how does economic growth, how to uh, uh, influence the thinking at other uh, entities in the US government, including the US DFC, to push for the type of long-term investment in some of the infrastructure that we need, because otherwise those benefits of growth are not going to accrue to the most, the, the most poor and the most marginalized, which I would argue ought to be the clear focus of what we're doing here, so. Thank you. So I had two other deep thoughts from my 500 Zoom calls that I'll overshare in this group. So one is, is that whatever your social capital was on March 15th is kind of what your social capital is on January 14th. That, and that, that's a longer conversation. But the second deep thought is, if you wanna have modernity in the future, you're gonna need literacy, drinkable water, toilets, electricity, and now you're gonna need whatever you wanna call it, digital. Like you're gonna, it's just the new electricity, whatever you call it, broadband, Wi-Fi, whatever the lingo, because if that's like a technology approach, but digital connectivity is just, you know, I've seen it all, you see, everyone sees it on this call everywhere. There's been more e-commerce, e-government, digital payments and distance learning in the last 38 weeks than in the last 38 years. So that's it. So I agree, that's, that's part of the new landscape. Okay, Amy, thanks for being here. See us, Amy Kokenauer Betancourt is the CEO of Cadasta. Amy is an alum of CSIS. It's nice to have you back virtually. Uh, I really appreciate your willingness to come on. Uh, and so I'm uh, one of the things I'm hoping you'll you'll help us with is this issue of I think there's an, an internet a nexus between good governance and economic growth. And you're in the sort of in the business of property rights, which is kind of part of the governance and rule of law agenda. And you're also in the the real, a lot of poor people, you work with urban poor and the rural poor on getting their land rights. So you have a human rights agenda as well. So you're not, again, you're not a straight up economic growth organization as well. And I, that was really a wonderful thing. We wanted to have you on because again, I want folks who are in this audience who don't do this for a living to connect this policy to what they do for a living that's not necessarily directed to economic growth. So thanks for being here, Amy. Thanks, Dan. I, I wanted to say I'm so excited to be back in the hallowed halls of CSIS, but I guess it's uh, the virtual halls. <laughs> so it's great to be here. Um, thanks so much for the invite. I appreciate it. And yeah, I, I, I want to just echo um, a lot of the things that have been said uh, by, by Michelle and Tessie in particular about the inclusion piece. I do think that is the strength of this policy. Um, for many years uh, before before Cadasta, I, I oversaw some of the implementation of Feed the Future projects, particularly in resilience. And um, what I think this policy does is it makes a more explicit link between the resilience programming and the economic growth programming, which I'm very happy to see because um, in implementing those programs, we spent a lot of time on 
uh, on uh, entrepreneurs, agropreneurs, uh, community-based uh, uh, businesses, businesses that were led by youth and women, um, <clears throat> cooperatives. And so bringing, you know, explicitly calling out those groups and saying that they need to be a part of the market economy is really critical. And I, I, I think that it'll lead to more continuity between resilience programming and economic growth programming. So I was really happy to see that piece of it. Um, I was also happy to see the piece of uh, acknowledgement of the environment and natural resources, although I would say I, I, I would like to see a little bit a little bit more of that. And I would like to see more of it in terms of uh, responsible investments. What are the responsible uh, what are the responsible ways for private sector to invest, particularly around land based investments when you see <clears throat> companies coming in and grabbing land from communities grabbing um, <clears throat> resources and poaching resources from communities, uh, uh, especially because of the informality of those rights. And I do wanna, I do wanna hit on that piece of the policy. Um, in the 2008 version of the policy, there were quite uh, a few references to land and property rights and resource rights. Uh, when I saw the, the revision in 2020, uh, in, a year ago, when we were with Dan in this uh, sort of feedback group, cons consultative group of development folks, including Tessie and myself, um, I saw that the new, the draft did not include uh, land and property rights uh, as a, not just as a simple input to uh, women's assets, for example, but as a fundamental a uh, requirement for a prosperous economy and as an enabling uh, factor for economic growth. Um, and along those lines, uh, I, I was really happy to see that the team took that consultation and took those uh, took that feedback and reintegrated land and property rights in a, in a much more robust way, in particular around women's land rights. Um, if, if, if there's one thing that you wanna to do to empower women, focus on women's land rights. We have economies in which 70 to 80% of the people living in those economies have no right, no registered rights to their land. That is a phenomenal statistic. And until we deal with the fundamental issue of, of tenure insecurity, how can we expect women and youth and small businesses and agri agripreneurs to invest in their businesses, invest in uh, climate smart agricultural practices, invest in, uh, uh, in the market economy? I think that is just fundamental and I really appreciate uh, the references to that in, in the policy. And I think that um, uh, land and property rights, even though it seems like a very narrow topic, it's actually applicable to every single one of the constraints that you mentioned. It's the market constraints, economic governance, inclusion, and environment. And on the economic governance piece, Dan, you asked me about governance. Um, let's talk about taxes and, and, and local resource mobilization for a second. What is, what is this, the, one of the, uh, the most effective ways of leveraging taxes? It's through property rights. You have local and state level governments who have been uh, uh, who have been tasked through decentralization with the allocation of land and 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 property and resource rights. However, uh, they have uh, they don't have data on people. They don't know who lives where. There's no documentation on the claims, and so you basically have uh, these local municipalities and 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 districts, rural districts who have no way of mobilizing resources on a tax base uh, because they just don't have that information. So I would say again, um, investing in those kinds of activities to collect the data, understand who lives where, what claims are, and to formalize those rights is one of the single most powerful things that can be done to advance economic growth. Um, and I just wanted to uh, speak also on the digital divide that Tessie uh, brought up. So Cadasta is an innovative technology platform and services to advance land and resource rights in what we say cities, farms, and forests. Uh, what we see in our work 
is this incredible um, just uptake of technology across the board and a real desire and, 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 and drive and enthusiasm, particularly among young people and, and increasingly among women to become more digitally literate, to engage with technology. And, I, and, and just one other piece of that is it's not just about, you know, how do you use technology? How do you use these different platforms? How do you collect data? It's also about how do we fundamentally empower small businesses, entrepreneurs, women, youth, and, and communities? How do we empower them to not only collect and, and, and um, understand their own data, but to use though, that data to advance their own development objectives and to advance community economic growth. An example of that would be, you know, rather than um, having, you know, in the past, the USAID and other bilaterals have put a ton of money into uh, reforming land administration systems at the national level. Hundreds of millions of dollars spent, huge systems put in place. And the fact of the matter is the impact of that has been quite limited. And that's why we still have 70 to 80% of <laughs> informal uh, land out there. But uh, some, of the, some of the other opportunities using technology, you know, you can have um, community level data collectors, para surveyors who are trained, which is also a, a digital job, who, who understand and know their communities, who can collect data on geospatial data, attribute data, and use that data, not only to advance land rights and secure tenure, but also for planning, for uh, understanding the natural resource use and all of these important issues that were raised as fundamental to economic growth. So um, that applies to indigenous communities. It applies to urban uh, communities, rural communities. Across the board, we've got to empower people digitally, as Tessie said, but not just about extractive data that goes somewhere on some server in a government office or in some corporate office where they use people's data to their own advantage, but rather empowering people around their own data to drive their own uh, actions around uh, livelihoods and, and, and participation in the market economy. So I'll stop there. And just one other uh, quetch, if, if I can use Tessie's word is, um, again, I, I said the responsible investment piece would be nice to see. I do think the uh, private sector has responsibilities that need to be uh, that need to be uh, taken into account in, in the way that investments are done. But also, I would really like to see the linkages to Agenda 2030. And I'll stop there. Thanks. All right, so I've got a ton of other questions. I'm cognizant of the time, so I'm all my questions I wanted to do. I'm going to have to call an audible because I want to. There's some very smart questions from the audience, so I'm going to bunch them all together, and then you all can kind of pick and choose what you want to respond to. Okay, so I got one from uh, American Foreign Service Association, uh, and this is what's the incentive for Joe or Jane FSN or Joe or Jane FSO? Foreign Service National Foreign Service Officer to pay attention to this, uh, given some of the you know some of the disincentives in terms of sort of the the uh, the stovepiping within AID. So maybe Bill, good luck with that, and I'll look forward to your answer to that question. But that's a that's a question that's out there. One from Steve Hadley, Steve Hadley, the other Steve Hadley, the one who is the Economic Growth Steve Hadley, the the aid alum. Uh, the policy points out the biggest challenge for promoting economic growth in the futurably fragile states. Thank you, Steve Hadley, my favorite topic. But it does not indicate whether or how approaches to economic growth in fragile states may need to differ from those elsewhere. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Has this thought been put to this? So I'd be welcome that. Will the policy be followed by a more detailed look at economic growth in fragile states? Great minds think alike, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Louise Fox of Brookings, another aid alum. How does this strategy support job creation in low income countries? Okay, interesting. Please give me an example of how USAID Economic Growth Program in Africa would shift under this policy. Great question. Thank you, Louise. We miss you and a shout out to you, Louise. Okay, very interesting question from Madison at McKinsey. Given the continued focus on enterprise level productivity and micro and small enterprises, how is USAID thinking about the next slash fourth industrial revolution? I think that's really interesting. 
uh, automation and AI and its inevitable impact on jobs in Africa and other low and middle income countries, how can you say programming broadly ensures contributing to readiness? Now here, let me just add an editorial point about this fourth industrial. We did a big, so clear your calendar, don't make it a Hulu night and read Romina Bandura, our senior fellow at CSIS is the future of work. She did two big reports and four country case studies. Like I said, you could, you could like instead of make it like, you know, skip six episodes of The Crown and read the four case studies and the two reports and the video. She spent a year on it, interviewed 300 people. And my short answer, the bumper sticker is, is that uh, AI and 4IR in many developing country contexts is gonna take a lot longer to happen than in sort of OECD countries. First question, that demography is a much more bigger disruptor. Our COVID and demography are actually bigger disruptors right now than say 4IR, but I think this is a legitimate point. And then that all, the other is, is that the issues of informality and social safety nets are as big a deal as 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 could AI and 4IR. So thank you, McKinsey, for your question. And, and let me just add that out. So, okay. So Steve Hadley, thank you, Steve. Economic growth in fragile states and what are we gonna do about that? And do we need to adjust it? Louise Fox of Brookings, how's the strategy support job creation in low-income countries? Examples of how programming will change in economic growth in Africa. Madison at McKinsey's excellent question about, okay, 4IR, uh, you know, tech disruption, what does this mean? And um, the ask the question about, okay, how are we gonna convince Joe or Jane FSN or Joe or Jane FSO to want to read this if they don't do economic growth for a living? Awesome questions, thumbs up, any and all. Let me start with you, Michelle. No, uh, great questions and, and glad to have this audience participation. Let me start with uh, the fragile states. Um, and Dan, I know that's you know, something you, you have a lot of interest in as well. This is a huge challenge for us. Um, and I don't want to say it's the elephant in the room, but it is right when we're talking about development world. Um, today, if I look at our portfolio, much of our work is actually falling under the umbrella of, I would say, addressing fragility and fostering resilience, right? Um, we recognize if we're going to meet our objectives, fragility is frankly the, um, you know, standing in the way of that, right? Because when we're focusing so much on the response and the humanitarian assistance, all very noble causes, we can't continue to foster development, right? And so one of the things we really looked at, and of course, many of you know, through our transformation, we have a new Bureau for Conflict Prevention and Stability. They're our lead on the U.S. Um, global uh, fragility strategy that came out of the, the Global Fragility Act. So we've worked with them really closely to think about how does this policy, how does our work uh, reflect this? And one of the things, I'm going to say two things about that. First is, one of the things I feel strongly about this that the policy does recognize is what is causing the fragile states, right? We have to look at it. Um, and we recognize a lot of times it's weak, it's corrupt, it's ineffective governance, right? Um, you know, what causes conflict? You know, Amy, I'm getting to, you know, back to your point, land rights issues, fighting over resources, right? Over land. These are all very important things we have to keep in mind. So one of the things we're, we're recognizing, um, there's never one size fits all model in any of our approaches to any of our development challenges. So when we're talking about fragility, one of the things that we recognize is when we're doing economic growth specifically, we're looking at any specific country through this lens of where are we at? Are we aiming to prevent a crisis before it occurs? Uh, are we working to stabilize in a country where there is crisis? Or are we creating conditions that are going to make sure they're bulwarks to external shocks, right? And so it is difficult and, and it's a multifaceted um, approach because we have to look at any given con context. So through the economic growth policy, we're really recognizing to the importance of commitment and capacity. So what do I mean by that? Resources, resources, resources. We need to look at one, what is the public trust? What is the governance? Is there accountability? Is there transparency? Are there public services? Uh, do citizens know uh, what the government is providing them uh, in, in way of resources, uh, economic support? Uh, and then we're also recognizing um, that we need to really show that transparency and accountability in those funds, right? This is a loop. Anytime we're doing this kind of work, we recognize the role the government's playing and then the effects that has on the citizen and how these things uh, work together. 
So uh, transparency and accountability is a big thing. Um, we need to strengthen those bonds between citizens and the state. Uh, and so getting to your point, I don't have a lot of time. I can go down a rabbit hole with this, but these are things we are very um, attuned to. Also really quickly, while I have the floor talk about the digital strategy and, and the fourth um, industrial revolution, uh, earlier this year, you may be aware we, the agency launched our new digital digital strategy. And I get to your point, and, and it's almost the same with what I was just saying. In any given context, we have to be very quick with our economic officers looking across sectors to see where a given country is. COVID pandemic, what did it show us? Breakdown in global supply chains. Companies that were able to survive, able to keep going, digital, right? They had e-commerce abilities, access. However, 5G is not the end all. It's not gonna be um, the North Star for everyone. It's depending on the context where we're working. One of the things we've done to really look at this is through our transformation, we took the wonderful innovation, research and development out of our former global lab for development. And we have created it into the new, um, a new hub uh, in DDI. And the point of this is either using AI, uh, either using other high-tech technology or even at looking at two earlier things, what are the low-tech solutions? AI and 5G won't be the answer to all of our questions, but we also can't preclude them. So one of the challenges I will say as a development agency in 2021 is understanding the particular landscape in any given country when we're trying to design and implement our programs. So there can't be a one-size-fits-all approach. And above all, we have to work with all of our officers to make sure they're contextually relevant solutions. Let me stop there for sake of time. Excellent. Okay, Bill. So over to you, buddy. Yeah, I love the question about the incentives. Um, you know, as an economist, uh, you know, we always worry about a lot about incentives. And I think those incentives are gonna come from um, our ability to enforce the uh, goals of this policy, which are to increase the use of economic analysis that underpin our programming uh, to 70, at least 75%. You know, economic analysis that, under, that sort of deeply understands uh, the constraints to market systems and governance systems uh, and where we work and the implications of that, uh, of our interventions on these systems. You know, and I, I think if that if we do that, then we can address a lot of the issues that, that, that everyone has raised. Uh, we can talk about job creation. Uh, USA Ideas is, is, has already produced a uh, employment framework. Uh, we're working on job diagnostics. Uh, in order to address those issues. Uh, when we're talking about uh, working in fragile states, we already, the EG policy, for example, calls on us to do more political economy analysis uh, to understand the sort of the power dynamics that, that underlie uh, fragile states. Uh, we're already doing inclusive growth diagnostics. So I really think that um, uh, you know, if we're able to meet these goals uh, for better and more uh, economic analysis in the program design phase and better and more um, use of impact evaluation and cost effectiveness analysis uh, to better understand and adapt to our, uh, adapt our programs around these issues. Uh, if we're able to enforce those, then I think those will create the incentives to do that kind of work. Okay, great. So Tessie, Amy, we start with you, Tessie. Yeah, so quick um, uh, comment. I mean, uh, you know, the issue about, you know, uh, stove, uh, stove uh, piping uh, if I may, you know, the, the, the last chapter of the policy talks about how economic growth principles apply in a variety of other sectors. And, you know, I thought, you know, those the points in that chapter were well um, taken. Um, you know, what's interesting to also think about is how principles and approaches and best practices in other sectors apply, uh, you know, and influence economic growth thinking. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so, for example, let's go back to your question about uh, DG and EG and the, and the intersection. Um, you know, if, if enterprise, if, if economic growth is about enterprise growth and, and um, you know, and we care deeply about the distribution of the income created by that growth, I would argue that economic growth cannot exist on its own. You absolutely need DG programming, DG principles. Why? Because it is about uh, civic engagement. It is about uh, institutions of participation and inclusion. It is, you know, it, it, those tools are essential to empower citizen 
uh, action to provide a voice and to make sure that the most marginalized are uh, heard and are served by any type of uh, uh, programming. And so where I'm headed to with this is, you know, I guess I would put a plug in for the importance of um, joint uh, training uh, and more joint discussion. The stovepiping, in my uh, observation as an implementing partner, is in part a result of, you know, economists talking to economists and DNG people talking to DNG and so on and so forth. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, uh, being intentional about how you bring this and different disciplines together is, I think, absolutely essential. I was part of a group uh, a, couple, a few years back that did uh, training for EG and DG officers together in E and E. Um, you know, head by uh, uh, David Coles and, and others. And I thought that was now to a certain extent that was done because there wasn't enough EG and DG to go around in these missions. Okay. But, you know, but the fact of the matter is, it's a good practice and it's a good approach. So I would think that, I, I would hope that you're being intentional in, in terms of how this is rolled out and the type of training and, and dialogue that needs to follow this because the document on its own is not gonna do it. The last thing I'll do is a plug for Steve Hadley's um, question. Yeah, I, as I said earlier, honestly, um, fragile states is where the is where the action is, and thinking deeply about how those principles apply in the context of those environments, I think is the is is the next uh, important thing to do. Thanks. Okay, Amy, and then I want I've got I got permission from my team, my team at CSS. We could go five minutes extra. I've got one question for the group about the doing business indicators that I want to come back to. But Amy, I want to give mm -hmm. you a chance to respond to what's been put on the table. Yeah. Tessie, I couldn't agree more with everything you said, and so I'm not going to repeat any of that. What I wanted to do is, is highlight a piece of the policy that I think is a bit of a nugget, and I think it applies across all of the, all of the uh, officers, all of the sectors, which is the systems level approach. How do you make high impact investments to unlock those constraints in order to have the broadest benefit for the most people? What are those things? And I think that is a real conversation that needs to happen across the sectors, not just within the economic growth uh, team. And um, there's, a, there's a reference to experimentation and innovation. And there was something about don't keep making the same investments over and over on the same things. I, I couldn't agree more. I think, um, I think the challenge as an economic growth officer or or, or uh, in the missions in general is, you know, what are those things that are going to move the needle in this particular economy, in this particular country, in this particular context, and. Um, there's a there was a statement in there that said, you know, sometimes it's hard to get staff to think small before scaling. And I would actually push back on that concept. And I would say, it's not about thinking small. It's about thinking big and starting small. So how do we think big across systems where we're going to have the most leverage, where the levers that we choose are going to have the most impact? And then how do we start small to design, test, iterate, learn, and then scale. And I think that's a bit of a mindset, a mindset shift. And I think that there's a lot of work that could be done at the mission level to kind of, um, to kind of dig into that and what that looks like for programming design. Okay, Thanks. so let me make one additional plug. For, okay, so if you care about food security, like there's a whole bureau called food security. Now, last time I checked, that's like run by smallholder farmers. So you need things like land rights, and you need access to finance, and you're probably running a small business. A lot of times it's an informal small business, but guess what? Smallholder farmers are small business people. So that's my little plug on, so, so you need to think about, this isn't just like an economic growth thing if you think about food security. And also a lot of the delivery of healthcare in Africa is not actually delivered by governments. It's actually delivered by the private sector. You see large swaths of education in Africa and other places delivered by the private sector, both nonprofit and even for profit. And there's like a whole debate about that, but that's a thing. Okay, so here's my question. I got I got permission to do a couple minutes of overtime. I care deeply about the doing business indicators. If you said to me what has changed the world the most in the last 20 years of the World Bank, one of the most biggest revolutions in global development has been the doing business indicators. Now, some of you on this call 
know that the doing business indicators took a lot of DNA from methodologies from AID in the 90s, in the early 90s. There are these spider web things. I forget what they're called, but you know, you all know out there what I'm talking about. They world bankerized them and packaged them and put them in a cooler, more marketing y way. And then AID funded the standing up and provide the political cover to stand up doing business. Well, doing business is in trouble. And I've done a lot of things to try and protect doing business because I think it's really important. So I'd like each of you to make the case as to why doing business still matters because it's related to this policy and it's related to economic growth. There's a, there was a, there have been 17 or 18 years of it. There's 180 countries. There was a finding that in four countries, somebody fiddled with the metrics. They happen to be bad countries like non-democratic countries. Um, including China and a couple of other countries that like, you know, there was some funny business and it puts the whole enterprise at risk because doing business has enemies. There are people who hate, are jealous of the attention it gets. They don't like the theory of change. They don't like countries being ranked. So I'm for protecting doing business. But it, so could each of you just sit, comment one thing? I hope you all are gonna say nice things about doing business. That's a leading question, but could you each have a comment about doing business? Let me start with you, Tessie. Uh, okay, well, thanks, Dan. I, I was not expecting that question, but look, I guess um, as a former uh, World Bank um, uh, director and uh, and somebody that actually worked a lot with Michael Klein and others, I yes, I and there is no perfect measure, and there have been difficulties in a variety of countries. But I would hope we would never throw the baby out with the bathwater. Measurement matters. Uh, and, uh, and to Bill's point about incentives, it has provided incentives. Has it sometimes you know, created a bad uh, dynamics because people are you know, sort of trying to game the system and change the things that are gonna matter on the indicators? Um, sure, look, I'm, a, I'm, I'm on the board of Friends of Publish What You Fund, right? And uh, we put out a report on transparency and we rate, you know, agencies and we worry that that agencies are trying to you know game you know the the system so that their ranking on transparency is higher than it ought to be but you know what it does it creates a dialogue around the issues and the importance of legal institutional reform and the enabling environment for for business growth for enterprise growth so uh, you know we need to continue to improve it we need to uh, uh, Create, uh, create even more transparency around how the indicators are put together, but I hope that we don't uh, we don't uh, eliminate them. That's the right answer. That's the answer I was looking for. Thanks, Tessie. Bill, what do you think? I absolutely agree. Um, you know, if there's one, you said to say one nice thing about the doing business indicators. Well, you know they're working if it's created incentives to cheat on them, right? That that that's how you. That's exactly how you know something is working. Uh, so, uh, you know, that said, you know, they're, they're great conversation starters, but going back to this issue of economic analysis, you know, it's a great starting point, but we need to do the deeper economic analysis. I mean, sometimes I think we rely a little bit too much on these global ranking indexes. And just because a country ranks low on a particular indicator on these, it doesn't necessarily mean that's a binding constraint to growth. So we need to do the deeper analysis to figure out, you know, what's, it might just be a cause, it might just be a symptom of low growth. So we really need to, again, do that economic analysis to figure out what's causing these low rankings on these indicators and, and figure out how we can do to change it, what we can do to change that. All right, so don't throw out the baby with the bath water, but let's use it as the, the mother of all cocktail party conversation starters, and then move to the economic growth policy of AID to actually get into the, the weeds of what's wrong, right? Correct, yeah, okay, that's absolutely. Good. Yeah. good, I'm going with that, I'm going with that. <laughs> Amy. Yeah, so doing business, yes. Um, I mean, we, I work in the, I, I'm in the business of uh, one of the most corrupt sectors. It's the second or third most corrupt sector in most countries, which is land. And, you know, yeah, we're trying to disrupt that um, by, by taking power to the people. I mean, that's part of it. But um, I, uh, overall, I think that those kinds of um, measures and, and, and indices are good. But I also want to repeat what I said earlier, which is, what is the what is the counterbalancing um, uh, list of responsibilities of companies to do responsible investing as well? 
So it, yes, the country environment on how easy it is to do business, but also what does it mean to be a responsible investor? What does that look like? Um, uh, what, what are the, what are the terms? How do you bring inclusion into that women's empowerment and all those other things that we talked about? So I would like to see, you know, also a discussion around that. I'll bring us home. Thanks for being here. Dan, thanks for having us. And again, I'm just so proud of, of Bill and Robin and the team that, that championed this. So um, for sake of time, build on what Bill says. The economic growth policy, to your point, has established targets, right, for conducting more formalized economic uh, analysis. It's underpinning all of our programming, right? Our target is that 75% of all of our economic growth programming will be informed by economic uh, growth analyses, right? And the, what's the whole point of this? To your, we got to dig in. To Bill's point, we have to dig in to say, one, in this context, in this country, do we think this intervention is going to meet this impact, right? We have to know that. But to do that, we also have to look at broader things, right, outside of those indicators. We have to look at growth di diagnoses, political economy analyses, uh, et cetera. So agreed, but we got to go deeper. Love it. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Congratulations, Michelle. Congratulations, Robin. Congratulations, Bill. Congratulations to the whole team that put this policy together. It was overdue. Good work. Thanks. And let's get, let's roll it out. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye.